What I want to do today with this message is, is pretty much give a, a topical message on um, different aspects of the Christmas story, but I don't just want to give you a shallow, you know, traditional Christmas story that you might have heard already. I, I want to get to the, um, you know, the, the, the essence of why Jesus had to come and die, the, the incarnation that, that, that brings, you know, eventually salvation. And so, this message is titled, The, the Five Piece of Chris Christmas. So there's going to be five Ps, that's pretty much the outline. And we'll start with the first P, and then we'll move on, and so on. Uh, but I do want to cover a few things, and I want to start at the beginning. I want to start with, the, with the, the, the very reason that, you know, Christ had to come. We're going to look at, start in Genesis, okay? So if you want to open your Bibles to Genesis, you can do that. I will show some of the verses up here as well, but we're going to focus first off on Genesis 2 and 3. Um... Let me pray one more time. Father, we, we do thank you, Lord, for this time. We thank you because your word is alive and it communicates to us with your will for us. We want to continue to worship you uh, as we open our hearts to your word. We ask that you minister to our hearts, uh, challenge us, encourage us. Every one of us is going through different things. Maybe some of us are, are getting over a cold or entering a cold. I just pray for you to, to heal um, those that are sick, Lord, at this time as we worship you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's get started. Our story begins with the problem, the problem, the main problem in humanity, and that is uh, sin. So number one, we look at the problem. In the beginning, the Bible says it was good. Every time God creates something, he says it is good, right? I think the only time God says it is, it is not good is when, you know, there was no partner for, for Adam, right? There was no wife uh, for Adam, no helper. Let me see if I can move this without messing this up. Um, and so we start with this problem. This is important because here in Genesis is where, where we see the first uh, prophecy, the first prophecy uh, looking forward into the future of the coming Messiah of the birth of Christ. We find this in Genesis as, as well. And we find it right after the fall. Right? We, after the problem comes, comes the, the, the promise uh, of God for his people, the solution for this problem. But the problem really is this. Man has sinned. We messed up, right? Eve was deceived by the, e, uh, by the serpent, and then she gave to her husband, and he chose, he willingly chose uh, to eat. They both sinned, and they fell, and they pretty much blamed somebody else, right? They played the blame game. It was, God, it was a woman that you gave me. You know, she gave me to eat, and then I ate, and then, you know... Adam chose to uh, not take responsibility for his own actions. And really, that, that's just a, the characteristics of, of the fall. A, a refusal to take responsibility for our own actions. And so, that is the problem, and that is connected to Christmas as well, because Christmas is not just, you know, a, a scene. It's not just about giving presents and, you know, getting dressed up for, for a service on Christmas Eve or whatnot. You know, Christmas has its roots in, in a problem. <coughs> The incarnation ha has its root in a problem. So here's our first point, if you guys are taking notes. Sin gave life to death. Sin gave life to death. And that was made clear in the creation story. It says in Genesis 2, 16 and 17, God says to Adam, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. You shall surely die. These last two words are very interesting in the Hebrew because the word surely can also be rendered die as well. Uh, in some uh, manuscripts, it's actually, it literally says in the, in, the, in the Hebrew, in the day that you eat of it, you shall die, die. Okay? Isn't that interesting? Where God is telling Adam, the, the moment or the day that you eat, that you disobey me, you're going to die, die. And I, 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 ref I say that again because when, when we sinned, when Adam and Eve sinned, it wasn't just a regular, ordinary death, right? It was a double death. They died spiritually, automatically. I think they died, they died spiritually initially and automatically. But they died physically, gradually. God's purpose for man before sin is, was to live forever. In Adam and Eve, they lived a very long time, but they eventually died gradually. And, and I, I want to emphasize this because death is, is, is what brings this uh, pain and suffering and hopelessness. The, the, the dreadful reality that, that, that we are uh, far apart from God. I mean, isn't that what we got from Adam and Eve? What did they do after, um, 
after they ate, what happened to them? Huh? They hid, right? Why, why, did, why did they hide? They were in fear, right? They, they were in fear. And see, fear is centered in sin. Fear is centered in, in, in disobeying God. And what, did, what did, did they do in order to cover their sin? Huh? They, they covered themselves with what? Leaves, right? And this, I think this is the first picture of, of religion. Man's, you know, uh, uh, useless attempt at, at being right with God. This, this useless covering. It is a picture of, uh, I think, religion uh, today as well. Uh, being right with God by our own good works. And so, man sins, nakedness, uh, the awareness of their nakedness, this fear and hopelessness and desperation sets in. And that's where it originates. And so I mentioned that because now when we look at the incarnation, the reason that, that Jesus comes and is, and is born of a virgin and so on is because essentially he wants to give us hope. He wants to give us life. He wants to, you know, kill death, if you will, right? Take the life away from death, the, the, the sting, as the Bible calls it, the power of death. That is the purpose behind the, you know, the, the, the incarnation and, 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 and his death and burial and, and resurrection. All these things are, are connected without Jesus, you know, being born of a virgin, living a sinless life, fulfilling the law. You know, we, we, don't, we, we don't have a Jesus who is on the cross and crucified. We need a Jesus on the manger first to get a Jesus on the cross and in the grave and out of the grave and so on. All these things are connected to the gospel and they have their root in sin. That was the, that was the problem. So, when man messes up, God anticipates that. God knew beforehand that, God, that man was going to mess up, that, that we were going to blow it. He is omniscient after all. And so God has a plan. God has a plan. That's number two. It says in Genesis 3.21, Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. So here we see, uh, if you will, a temporary plan. They clothe themselves with, uh, you know, li leaves. But God chooses to clothe them. Notice he's the one that's clothing them. He's clothing them with a temporary garment, and we can assume it's animal, and some animal is sacrificed to clothe them temporarily, right? And my, uh, this, this is just speculation. Some people, some pretty good scholars have the same speculation as well, but some, some believe it could have been a lamb. He could have, you know, killed the first, uh, that was the first animal that, that was killed, and it was a consequence of the fall. Something innocent dies because of something guilty. I think that would, that would be prophetic in a sense because Jesus is called the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And it does remind me of uh, the story of uh, um, Abraham, or Abraham and, and Isaac, how they, you know, they, they go up to the mountain. God asks Abraham to, uh, to sacrifice his son, and he's about to do it, and the angel stops him, and, and we see that there's a ram in the thicket, and there in that passage it says, you know, the, the Lord will provide, right? The Lord is going to provide. God himself is the one providing for, for the sacrifice, and, and I see that here. The actual verse is in Genesis 22, 8, if you're interested. My son, God will provide himself a lamb. God will provide himself a lamb. And so God is the one that clothes us. It, 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 any other pavement is, is not sufficient. It needed to be uh, God in the flesh to die for, for our sins. Now, I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the message that we, the, the first prophecy is found in Genesis and it points to the Christmas story, to the incarnation. We find that in chapter 3, verse 15. And it says... I will put enmity between you, he's speaking to the serpent, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his here. Uh, excuse me, heel. The Lord is alluding here to the incarnation and the overall work of Jesus Christ on the cross. See, the interesting thing is that w he uses the word seed connected to the woman, right? And, and we all know the women don't have seed. It, it, some newer Bible translations will render it offspring, and that's okay, I get that. But I think the, the idea, what he's implying here, is the virgin birth. And it does make sense. So what, is, what, what, what does it mean here where it says where, uh, you know, he shall bruise your head, or one translation says he shall crush your head, and you shall bruise his heel. What does that mean? The, the crushing of the head of the serpent of the enemy, the accuser of the brethren, is, is referring to a fatal blow which is made on the cross of Calvary. The, the bruising of the heel is referring to the death of Christ. 
it's not a fatal blow, but it does cause some harm. And it does sort of suggest the, the, you know, the temporary time that Jesus remained, you know, in death, if you will. And so we have the first prophecy of the first Christmas, right? The prophecy of the incarnation way back when, where we had a problem, we find that God already had a plan. And here's our point. The problem is with man, but God has a plan. Christmas reminds us that God anticipates things, that God doesn't need a plan B, that God, you know, He, he, he is the Savior for the world. He is the answer to all our problems. Whatever we're going through, he, He's always the answer. And I pray that you are, you'd be reminded of that this uh, Christmas. The problem is with man, but God has a plan. I want you to look at, at John 3 in your Bibles. In John 3, we look at a conversation between Jesus and this religious man named uh, Nicodemus. Sometimes when we teach messages on that, you know, pastors want to be clever, and they, say, they title it, Nick at Night. Because he's, co he's coming to him in the evening. Uh, we assume that he didn't want to be seen by his religious friends and so on. But he believed in Jesus. He, 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 he had some form of belief in Jesus, and he's inquiring generally. He believes that he's a good teacher at least, right? I don't think he was, he was uh, born again yet or, or a believer truly yet, but he does have some belief in Christ Jesus. And, and I want to make sure I mention this passage because at the beginning I told you that when we died, when Adam and Eve died, they died, died, right? And so if somebody dies, die, die, dies, this double death, we need a, a double life as well. And I think that's what Jesus is referring to here in John 3.3. 3. It says, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, or more literally from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God, Nicodemus says in verse 4, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And so it, it, the context is clear. He's talking about a physical birth. And a spiritual birth, right? He's talking about being a, a, an earthly birth and a heavenly birth. Everybody's born once. We're all born of water, if you will. I don't believe this is talking about water baptism. I think it's clear he's talking about the, you know, the, the amniotic fluid. When they say, well, the water broke, it's because, again, referring to that, the infant is encased in the womb, which is, again, there's water. That, that's what he's referring to here. So everybody's been born of water already, but that's not enough, right? Because we're going to die, we need spiritual life. We need this, this heavenly birth. And that's what we call being born again. And the Bible does talk about in Revelation about the second death for a reason, this permanent death. See, our point is this. Christ was born on earth so we can be born in heaven. Christ was born on earth, the whole Christmas story there, so we can be born in heaven. That is the purpose behind this. The gospel is essential to this, this Christmas story. It's always been. Now look at number three now. Our third P here is patience. Patience. And the patience is still connected with God's plans. So we have, got, we have the, the problem. We have uh, the plan. But we also have the patience that we need to talk about. And the first thing I want you to note with regards to patience, there's two things. The first thing is this. God's plans often start small. God's plans often start small. And number two, God's plans take time to grow and develop. God's plans start small, and God's plans take time to grow and develop. Look in your Bibles at, at, at Luke 2. I might have it up here as well, Luke 2.10, yes. In Luke 2.10 to 12, we read this. Then the, this is a, the story of the shepherds here out in the field. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tithings of great joy, which will be to all people. Uh, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe, not a grown man, but a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And so th there's many reasons why Christ had to be born. But one definite reason, again, or, or one secondary perspective, application at least is that God does allow his things to develop over time. Jesus needed to grow in a few things. Okay. Now often we try to stay away from the topic of Jesus having to learn things, but we cannot because the Bible does say even in Hebrews that Christ learned obedience through his suffering. 
And that doesn't take anything away, by the way, from the, the, uh, the divinity of Christ. If Philippians 2 makes it very clear that Christ in, in, in coming did not lose his divinity. He only gained humanity, okay? He, he, he became a human being, and the Bible says he never sinned. Yet we see a powerful picture, I think, uh, of how God works sometimes. He'll start things small, and he'll allow them to develop and grow till eventually his purposes are fulfilled in, in his plan. But we need patience. We need patience. You see, the, the, the angels tell the shepherds that a king is born. They start praising him right away. Even though Christ is not going to the cross right after he's, you know, he's, he's waned, right? No, he has to grow. There is time that needs to, to, uh, to elapse. Here's one, one example. We see it in verse 52, this same chapter. Luke, uh, uh, in, what is it? Luke 2, 52. It says, Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. So here is one example of the things that Jesus need, needed to grow and develop in. In stature, right? He didn't remain a baby. He didn't remain in the car seat, right? He outgrew the car seat and he grew up and he did what he needed to do. But he also grew in favor with God and with all people. So here's our next point. Don't rush things because the best things start small and take time to grow. Don't rush things because the best things start small and take time time to grow. The Christmas story teaches us to just enjoy the, the Savior as He is. He had a family. Mary would, would, would enjoy her son till he grew up to, to you know, 30 years old or so when, when he uh, eventually engaged out in the ministry according to his father's will, right? And so we see a Savior who takes time to grow as a normal human being. I mean, he was the perfect brother and the perfect son, no doubt, but, but it took time. And it does tell us something. At least it ministers to me in the sense that, you know what, maybe God has a plan for you and for me, but, but it's not going to be a right away thing. Maybe God is working some things out behind the scenes, and maybe, maybe you're like me sometimes where, I want this now, Lord, I, 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 I can't wait. You said this way back when, and, and why hasn't it happened? And sometimes we got to think and see how God has worked in the past with His most important things, I would say. The most important being the incarnation of, uh, of Christ and his death and so on. Maybe sometimes it's us. Maybe God is telling you, hey, you got to grow a little bit, right? You got to grow up a little bit before I use you to do this or, or this happens in your life. And so we see this, this principle, if you will, of, of things starting small and then growing. But it takes time. It takes uh, patience. So here's the next thing. Personal. Personal. When I say personal, I'm referring to a relationship. The incarnation has a lot to do with relationships as well. Christmas has a lot to do with family and relationships. And here's another reason I believe why the Lord, you know, he grew up. He was, you know, he was born of a virgin, no doubt. Prophecy was being fulfilled. But there was family involved. Jesus could have chosen to come like, you know, Terminator. Where, you know, in the movie, he just comes, he appears as a grown man and so on. But he doesn't do that. He, he comes from heaven. He leaves perfection. He leaves the glory of heaven. The, this closeness with the Father to come down and take on, take on humanity, right? And so this speaks about family as well because he chooses. God chose a family. God chose a woman and a man that were, that were planning to be married. And he chooses them for his son to be born through her in the virgin birth. And so I can't teach on Christmas without being reminded of the importance of, of family. Jesus had to sacrifice something to come to us. And so when I think of, about family as well, and especially during this time when we, when we go visit family and when we spend quality time together, you know, Jesus had to put something down. He, he left something for something else, right? And that's how we see love, by the way. We see love by sacrificing something and giving ourselves towards that object of our love. And we see that in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave. So there's a giving, right? But Jesus needed to sacrifice something in order to give himself. He sacrificed heaven, even if it was temporary, to come down to us, wretched man, to save us. And that's something we can meditate on as well. Look at Isaiah 7.14, this prophecy of the virgin birth. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, 
and shall call his name Emmanuel. The, the, uh, <clears throat> the writer of Matthew, Matthew tells us or defines what this word Emmanuel means. Matthew says, they shall call his name Emmanuel. He's quoting again from the, the prophet Isaiah. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And the reason I, I share this verse is not just because of its prophetic significance, the accuracy of, of a Messiah being born in the virgin birth, this miracle, but I mention it because in the very word of Christ, this title for the Lord, Emmanuel, it means God with us. And that talks about, that speaks volumes about God wanting to be close to us, all right? And relationship, personal. Christmas is, is a personal thing. Maybe this Christmas, maybe the Lord is trying to tell us, hey, you know, Albert, maybe you need to put your phone down so you can embrace your family. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe we need to disregard, sacrifice this right now, put it on pause so you can just embrace, come close to your family. Come close to someone this, this Christmas because Christmas is, is personal. And Emmanuel, I mean, if we just look at the name Emmanuel, it tells us something, right? God wants relationship. God wants to talk to us. Now, don't get me wrong. I understand the sovereignty of God. I understand that, you know, we, we fall short of God's glory. And God, in, in reality, He doesn't need us to, to add anything to Himself. But that's love. He chooses to, to give of Himself. But it, it, looking at the Scriptures, God wants fellowship with us. That's why Jesus says in, in John 3, He's knocking. He's outside of the church, right? The church that has left Christ outside, He's knocking. He's like, I'm knocking if anybody answers and hears, hears my voice and answers the door. I will come in and dine with Him and He with me. That's talking about fellowship. God wants fellowship with you. You, you matter to God. But you need to open that door to Him. And, and Christmas reminds us of that, that God wants to know us. God wants to, God knows us already, but He wants us to know Him and know Him deeply. So if you go back to the garden, what was Adam doing before he sinned? Oh yeah, he was a zookeeper slash, you know, um, gardener, right? He was taking care of the garden and the animals and all that. And he was a husband. But he was also walking with God. And that's something that we cannot forget or ignore. And there's, that talks about fellowship, walking with God. Can two walk together unless they agree, the Bible says. And so sin separates us. When they sinned, they were evicted from the garden. There was a separation from God. And so now we have the incarnation. God now coming down, wanting to be close. And that's why I say Christmas talks about the gospel so much. It tells us of his love, how he wants to be close to us. Christmas is personal. But somebody needed to be vulnerable. Jesus needed to be vulnerable in order to be personal. That's our next point. He became vulnerable to be personal. God doesn't just abide with humans. He became a human. He never sinned. But Christ became us to save us. Okay? He never sinned, but He took on flesh in order to die for our sins. And notice when we read the Gospels, uh, His life is not taken from Him. He gives it up of Himself, of His own will, of His own power. So when I look at the, at, the, at the Christmas story, it is a reminder of what God was going to do. It is a reminder of family. It reminds me that there was a problem and God was the answer. All these things run through my mind when I think about Christmas. He became vulnerable to be personal. Here's another verse that we uh, can glean from. 1 John 4.10 says, This is real love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. And do you see right here, just in verse 10, we see the, uh, the birth of Christ and the death of Christ. Oh yes, it doesn't say, it doesn't mention the word birth, but it is in sending Him, Him coming, it's implied that He's coming, and then He eventually grows up in His sacrifice, and the purpose is to take away our sins. So the birth of Christ, Christmas is really Christmas all year for the Christian, that's what we should be aware of as well. So here's the first qu a few questions, personal questions for us before we move to the next P. What can I put aside so I can come closer to my family today? What do I need to put away so that I can enjoy others? And number three, what sacrifice do I need to make to not blink and open my eyes to regret? Because time, time flies. People, people are gone, you know, one minute. The kids grow up so fast, and it's so easy to, for life to just flash by, and, and then regret hits in. And then, you know, well, yeah, I didn't do good with my kids. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make up with my grandkids. I'm just going to spoil them and this and that, right? And so, 
you know, don't let life just pass you by. Take, adva uh, take advantage of it. Take advantage of the times in your family. Today I was reading a, a news article, uh, I think it was today, sometime in the morning, here on Avenue, <laughs> Avenue B in County 14th or 16th. A uh, young lady, um, I don't know if she was texting or what, but she, she crashed into uh, a semi and they didn't know if she was going to make it. She had to be taken somewhere else. And so, it, you know, life comes and life can leave just as easily as it comes. And it's important to take advantage of family and our time with others. That leads us to the next P, which is really our last P, and that's people. But for this one, I, I want us to look at um, Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, starting here in verse 26. In Luke 1, 26, we'll read the actual, you know, the context and the, and, and, the, and the Christmas story in light of the conversation that Gabriel has with Mary when he brings her the good news. In Luke chapter 1, verse 26, I'm going to start here. It says, Now in the sixth month... This is in the sixth month of, of Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth's pregnancy. The angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin uh, betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Betrothed just means that they were planning to, to, to get married. It, it was a stronger term. Uh, it was more than just being engaged. Sometimes when you were betrothed and there was infidelity, um, that was considered adultery as well. That's how it was almost marriage. And so you have this young couple, this young girl, probably 15, 16, I don't know, um, she's planning to get married. Nothing new. There was, not, there was nothing extraordinary about the life of, of Joseph and Mary, per se. They were, they, you know, young people got married, and they, went on with, they had kids, and they went on with their life. But the angel goes to her house for a reason. And it says, The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. I mean, I mean, I don't know who, I mean, even a man would be troubled, right, if an angel just appears in your house and he starts talking to you. I'm sure there was something visible, something different about him. So he tells her in verse 29, no, excuse me, verse 30. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You have found grace with God. You have found God's favor. Verse 31. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. What we read in, in um, Genesis 3.15, the Proto-Evangelium, as they call it, the, the first mention of the gospel, here it is being announced again and about to be initiated he tells her, don't be afraid. You found favor with God. And he precisely tells her what is going to happen. You will conceive in your womb, bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Again, Mary comes from the line of David, physically. And then her husband, legally, Joseph, also came from the line of David. God, is, God has all the ends covered. He's fulfilling his prophecy. He's keeping his word to the exact jot and tittle here. And so, he reveals this to her. He continues in verse 33. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. That's Israel. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? It was, it was, it was impossible, right? Being a virgin. I'll leave it at that. And so, she's fearful. He calms her down. He tells her the specifics. But she's concerned about how these things are going to happen. I love what the angel tells her shortly after this. She sa he says in verse 35, And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will, highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. So, here's what's happening. He's like, God is going to do this for you. And it's a miraculous thing. It hasn't happened yet. But I want to show you some evidence here. Something to be encouraged by. Your cousin, a relative of yours, somebody you know. She was barren. There was no way she was going to have kids anymore. And God is doing a miracle in her life. So... She, he's trying to encourage her by showing 
her a miracle in somebody else's life in order for her to embrace the miracle that God wanted to do in her life. Here's the verse I love. Verse 37, For with God nothing will be impossible. And that speaks volumes as well, right? With Mary, yeah, who's going to be able to birth the, the, the king, the savior into the world? No, no, no one can do that. Only God can do that. It is of the, a thing of the Holy Spirit. It is impossible with man. What is impossible with man is possible with God, the Bible tells us. Verse 38, I love her response. This should be our response to anything that God calls us to do, right? Mary said, Behold the maid servant of the Lord. The Greek is doulos, the, the female version of doulos, right? I am the slave of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel, that's all he needed to hear, by the way. The angel departed from her. So there's just two things I want to mention here in regards to people. God using people. God fulfills his plans. He, you know, he does what he needs to do. He uses people to save people. All the glory goes to him. Well, one thing to take note of, and this is like a side point, but it's important, is that God often uses occupied people, right? God uses people that were already occupied doing something else, involved in their own affairs. Mary again, young lady, she's doing what is expected of her. She's looking to be married, and I'm assumingly to have kids as well. And so, number one, God uses occupied people, and we see it throughout the scriptures, don't we? We see it with David. David was without, out with the sheep when it was time for him to be anointed. Um, we see it with, with Moses as well. In the story of the burning bush. He's out, again, a shepherd. Uh, we see it with the prophet Elisha. He's out, you know, plowing the fields or working with the oxen when Elijah comes and throws his mantle over him. God called him when he was busy doing something. Peter was fishing or, you know, taking care of, cleaning his nets at the end of a failure of a fishing night. When the Lord comes and says, I'm going to make you a fisher, men follow me, and so on. Uh, Matthew, the tax collector, what was he doing when Jesus approached him? He was counting money, right? People are busy doing something, occupied with something, when the Lord calls them for something greater. And I'll, I want to emphasize this because sometimes we say, well, I can't be used by God because I'm busy, because I'm working, because I'm doing this and that. I just got too, much, too many kids in the house, too much family, and, uh, uh, you know those things are not disqualifiers. Sometimes, biblically speaking, sometimes those are qualifiers, you know? Because God, God will use people that are busy for His glory. God is not going to look at your calendar and say, well, let's see, you know, if uh, Joe has is, is got time for me this week. No, He's going to lay out His plan, and if you want to, if you're going to take it, you're, you're going to take it. If not, you're not. And I'm reminded of, of, of Esther, right? Mordecai tells her, you know, well, maybe for such a time, such a time as this, you, you know, it, it's come to you now. But if, if, if you don't do it, God is going to bring something, someone else to do it, surely. And so we have passages like that in the scriptures, and sometimes they're hard to compromise with passages like Jonah, right? Jonah says no, and God, God had told him to go some way, and God made him go, right? So, so we have different passages where if we, if we fail to take the initiative, God will surely bring somebody else, you know. But the point is this. Mary was called to do something great, even though she was doing something good already, and she took advantage of that. God uses occupied people. An occupation is not an excuse, but a qualification to be used. That's our next point. An occupation is not an excuse, but a qualification to be used. You can be busy, but never too busy for God. I think, you know, here are some excuses that I wrote down that maybe, maybe Mary could have given if she was living in today's time. I'm not qualified for this. I don't have enough experience in this, right? I haven't had any kids. Why do you choose me? I can't foster a child. I don't even have my own. I've got too much going on right now for this. This is too big of an assignment. Again, this, we're talking about God in the flesh here, the Savior, right? Carrying Him for nine months and delivering Him. Making sure He doesn't get hurt because you want a healthy Savior to die for the sins of the world. And, you know, all these things that can run through our minds when we just think about why we can't do something for God. And she didn't, there's no evidence that she did any of that. Even though she had the normal feelings that we, we would have. She was in fear of just the whole occasion. But nonetheless, this woman, I believe, was someone who was already... Uh, God fear. See, the special thing about Mary wasn't just that she came from the line of David, all right? Yes, God, God was going to fulfill his prophecies and he was going to bring the Messiah through the tribe of David, but I think there was something special about Mary in regards to why she had found favor with God. I think Mary feared the Lord. I think Mary already had a habit of serving the Lord in her own life. 
Again, we're talking about pre-cross, pre so she kept the law, right? As a, again, nobody can keep the law perfectly, but she was a, a, a Jew who tried to keep the law, not break the law. She wasn't what the, what the Pharisees would call sinners, those who, who were carnal and worldly. They were all sinners. And so the second thing I want you to take note of is that God uses humble people. God uses busy people, but God uses humble people. How do I know that Mary was humble and Joseph? Because they hear the word and they do the word, right? That's what a humble person does. A humble person is not too high for God. A humble person gets over themselves and gets under God to do God's will. And that's one thing that we see about Mary. Because see, the Christmas story has a lot to do with Mary as well. And Joseph as well. He has his part in this also. Look at what she says again in verse 38. Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. You see what I'm saying? God, God cares more about your mindset than your skill set. He cares about your, the, the humility. Are, are you willing to, to serve me so I can use you? And this is what we see here. Yes, the Savior was going to be born, but he used the servant for the Savior to be born. And, and what I'm saying here in another sense is this. God, God can use you, he can use me, to the degree that we humble ourselves and are used by him. We need to be able to say, Behold, Lord, the, the maidservant of the Lord, here, here I am. Let it be to me according to your word, just as he, just as she said here in the scriptures. Look at Mary's heart. This is why I emphasize this, and I'll finish up with these last words. But in Luke 1, 46 and 48, this same chapter, but later on when she visits uh, um, her cousin Elizabeth, this is what Mary says in, in Luke 46, 1, 46. Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Okay? Mary, Mary wasn't sinless. She was a sinner like everybody else. But she found favor with God because she feared the Lord and she served the Lord. For he has regard... For, my, for the humble state of his bond slave. Notice that. For behold, from this time on, on all generations will count me blessed. Why is she blessed? Because she was a servant before she was a mother. Because she was blessed with the purpose. Because she was blessed with God's son. And because she was faithful and fearful and she put God first. Right? And these are, these are the things that we can grab onto this Christmas and, and, and be encouraged to. Christmas should encourage us to be better servants for the Lord. Regardless of our age, we're still servants. We're still do losses. See, she carried Jesus in her womb so that we can carry Jesus in our hearts. I didn't make that a point, but I think that's a good one. She carried Jesus in her womb so that we can carry Jesus in our hearts. And Christmas is a reminder of that. That Jesus has already been born. He has already died. He has already risen. The Holy Spirit has come down. The Holy Spirit lives in us. If you're, if you're a believer, if you're trusted in Christ, if you've repented of your sins and accepted the living Savior in your heart, then God has a purpose for you. God has a calling for you today. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for your son. Lord, may, may our familiarity with the Christmas story not get in the way of of, of us being, uh, living in anticipation and exi excitement, Lord. We want to be excited for the things of you. We don't want this to just be another Christmas Eve or, or Christmas uh, day tomorrow. We want to live for you every day, Lord, even if it's not a holiday. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.